Please be seated if you would. We welcome you to Jesus the Lord Outreach Center this morning. Glad that you're here to worship the Lord, to minister unto Him. Praise God for what He is doing in your life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Roy, you're needed in the back. Hallelujah. Praise God. We always want to greet those that are here for the first time. If this is your first time, never been here, would you raise your hand? Praise God. I know we have a few. There's a gentleman here. Praise the Lord. Another gentleman here. We're glad that you've come to worship with us. Praise God. Hope you'll take the time to read the good news for you, our 12-page publication. We've had 100,000 of those printed, distributing them to people, one after another, house after house, person after person, to get the gospel of the kingdom into the hands of people. God wants everybody to be born again, receive the Holy Spirit, be healed, be delivered, walk in the ways of the Lord, walk in victory in their life. Praise God. We're going to worship, worship the Lord as we bring up our tithes and offerings unto Him. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to worship you and to bring of our tithes and offerings to you. We bring them to you freely, excitedly. We give to you because we want to. As we sow, we know we're going to reap. And Father, we thank you that you are causing all grace to abound toward us, that we have all sufficiency in all things and may be able to abound to every good work. Father, thank you for meeting the need of every individual in this place according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, wait on the people, if you would, please. Praise God. Regular service times are Sunday morning at 10, Sunday evening at 6.30, Wednesday, 7 o'clock. We have intercessory prayer on Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Deliverance ministry on Saturday from 10.30 to 12. First, we make an appointment with you to talk about the specific areas of need in your life, begin to minister to those specific areas of need. Praise God. We want to salute all those mothers to say happy Mother's Day to all those of you who are mothers. The Bible says that you are to be a joyful mother of children. It says in Psalms 113, verse 9. The Bible says the fact that we are to bless our mother. Those who did not bless their mother got cursed. The Bible talks about that in Proverbs chapter 30. The Bible speaks about the fact that the mother taught it says, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, his mother taught him the words of the prophecy and the word of God. If you're a mother, be teaching your children the word of God. They need to hear the word of God. We see the fact that the Bible says, honor the father and the mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee and thou livest long on the earth. You must honor your mother and father, regardless of what they've done to you. If your mother didn't treat you well at times, forgive your mother. Do not hold grudges or bitterness or resentment or anger or evil attitudes. You are responsible to forgive every person regardless of what they've done to you. We need to honor our mother. 2 Timothy 1.5 says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that's in thee, which first dwelt in the grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also. God wants the faith to be passed along from generation to generation as you teach the Word of God to your children and get them established in the Word. If they will hearken to it and be a doer of it, they will pass that on to the succeeding generations. Praise God. I want to pray for every mother right now. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for every mother that is here. Thank you for all that you have done in their life. Thank you for the blessings that have come forth of being a mother. Father, at the same time, there's certainly those who have seen sorrow come because of children that have not chosen the way of the Lord. Well, Father, we just thank you for encouraging each mother this day, comforting them, encouraging them. And Father, we thank you for just renewing a, a right attitude, if there is not one, that they would teach the Word of God to their children, that they would pray for their children, that they would work continually to instill the faith of the Lord Jesus in them. And Father, we thank you that we honor the mothers this day. And we thank you and praise you for your blessings upon them. Father, thank you as they continue to carry out their service unto you, even if their children are grown and gone on in their own life apart. Father, thank you that they continue to pray for them and continue to minister the Word of God to them. Thank you for your blessings upon each mother as they are hearers and doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
We're going to pray for all men as well and pray for our nation before we get into the Word. This morning, just agree with me as I pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for every person who's never received Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Father, we know that if a person does not receive Jesus, that they will not go to heaven, that they must be born again. Thank you for bringing every person who's never received Jesus throughout this world, the gospel to them. Thank you for sending the labors to them. Thank you for revealing the truth to them. Thank you for opening their eyes that they must receive Jesus and be born again. Thank you for bringing a revelation of the truth. Thank you for convicting them of the sin of not believing on Jesus, bringing them to repentance that each one would receive Jesus. Thank you for the great harvest of souls. Thank you for causing multitudes to be born again in Jesus' name. Father, we do continue to pray for this nation. We know that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and heavenly places. We bind all the evil spirits that are at work against this nation. We cast you down, we loose your hold, we throw you down, we destroy all your works over this nation in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that righteousness exalts a nation, and blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Father, we thank you for moving mightily among the people to bring them to the place of repentance. Bring the fear of God upon everyone in this nation, upon all of our leaders. Thank you for turning the ungodly to his heart towards you or removing them from office. And thank you for bringing the righteous into positions of authority because when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. Father, thank you. We continue to stand in the gap, remitting the sins of this nation from its founding to this moment. We know that as we do so, that we are your people called by your name who humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. And because we do so, we know that you hear from heaven, you forgive us our sins. We thank you for healing our land. Thank you for doing whatever is necessary to bring this nation to repentance and to restore it to righteousness. We thank you and praise you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Stand with me if you would. We're going to pray as we get into God's Word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your Word. Your Word is the truth and we receive it this day written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. This morning we're going to talk to you on the subject of walking in the Spirit walking in the spirit in the spiritual realm which is absolutely of a necessity for every believer in Jesus Christ. We see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23. It says the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are made of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. You are a spirit, that's the real you on the inside. You have a soul made up of your will, your intellect, your emotions. You live in a physical body. That is the house that you live in. Your spirit is the real you on the inside of you. It is essential that you have a spirit that is right with God. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 3, in verse 7, He said to the said to them, he said, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. It's not an option. You must be born again. It's absolutely necessary for everybody to be born again. What does it mean, again, when it says born again? This word again is a Greek word which means literally from above. For you who are here for the first time, in the lower window is Strong's number corresponding to Strong's concordance with the Greek word and it gives meanings that are important from above. You must be born from above. What's that talking about? It's not talking about a physical birth. It's talking about a spiritual birth. Because prior to that, he said, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born of water? That's physical birth. Because of the fact that when you are in your mother's womb, you're encased in a water sack, and when that water breaks, you're going to be born. You're encased in that. You're born of water, physical birth. But then there's also being born of the Spirit, which is spiritual birth. We know this is what he's talking about. He says, that which is born of the flesh, that's physical, is flesh. We've all been born of the flesh, of course, because we're here. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. If you've never been born again, it is the most important decision that you ever make. You must receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior and be born 
again. Now this is the, what Jesus declared, was declaring what Ezekiel meant back in Ezekiel chapter 36. In Ezekiel 36, we see over here in verse 26, a prophecy was given by Ezekiel, and he said, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. That's what happens when you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Why do we need a new spirit and a new heart? Because our spirit is not right with God because of the fall of man. And everyone who is born physically does not have a spirit that's right with God. That's why we all have to be born spiritually, born again. And you get a brand new heart, and you get a brand new spirit. What do you get? You get the spirit of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, over in verse 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. That's the Spirit of Jesus Christ that comes into your heart when you are born again. Crying, Abba, Father, now God is your Heavenly Father. You have relationship with Him. And what has happened? You become brand new on the inside of you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, down in verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, because he's received Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, He's a new creature, a new creature or a new creation. You're brand new. You've been born from above. You get a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Where are all things become new? In your spirit, which is who you are. Not in your soul, not in your body. You've got the same mind, will, and emotions. You've got the same physical body. The change occurred in your spirit. And now you have the spirit of Jesus Christ. This happened by the work of the Holy Spirit when you received Jesus, because this is scripturally declared to be, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. What's the body? The body of Christ that we come into when we're born again. That is the baptism. The word baptism is an untranslated Greek word, baptizo, which means to immerse, submerge, or engulf in. Therefore, you and I are submerged, immersed, and engulfed in the presence of the Holy Spirit when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. And what happens? He takes the old spirit out and a new spirit comes in. We get a new spirit and a new heart. It is the spirit of Jesus Christ. And we've now come into the one body, the body of Christ, which is what we come into when we're born again. And we have the spirit of Jesus Christ now. Now there was another aspect to the prophecy that Ezekiel had. He said in Ezekiel 36, 26, about the new heart, as we saw, the new heart and a new spirit will I put within you. But then the next verse, he says, and I will put my spirit within you. This is the Father speaking, my spirit. This is the, sp father, the spirit that proceeds from the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. Important to understand that the spirit of Jesus Christ proceeds from Jesus. While the Spirit of the, of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, proceeds from the Father, as it says in John 15, 26. Jesus said, I will send you unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father. So the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. It is the Spirit of the Father. And the Holy Spirit is received after you're born again. If you have received Jesus Christ and been born again, great. If not, I hope you will choose to receive him when we give opportunity for you to come up and pray at the end of the service. We want to pray for you to be born again. Next, though, because you have now the Spirit of Jesus Christ, you need to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is received after you're born again. In Acts chapter 8, in verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ unto them. He talked about receiving Jesus, their personal Lord and Savior. They gave heed to the things that, he, that Philip spake. And they also were hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. It says down here in verse 12 that they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. They were baptized, water baptism, showing forth what happened on the inside of them when they received Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. Then we come to verse 14. When the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they got born again. What did they do? They said unto them, Peter and John, Peter and John come. And what are Peter and John coming to do? They're coming to minister something else. 
who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now you see the term receiving of the Holy Spirit. The word receive is a Greek word, lambano, which means to take, to take hold of, take or lay hold of something, to take in an active sense. When you are a born again believer, you now have relationship to God as your heavenly Father, and now you have the ability to receive the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in you, so that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Had the Holy Spirit come into them yet? No, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They'd been born again, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet. What'd they do? They laid their hands on him and they received the Holy Ghost. The same thing is shown forth in Acts chapter 19 over in verse 2, when Paul found some disciples at Ephesus and he said to them, have you received, have you taken the Holy Ghost into you since you believe? They were believers, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit. You must understand that receiving the Holy Spirit is subsequent to salvation. There are those today who believe that you get the Holy Spirit when you're born again. It is false teaching, it's not the truth. We've made it very clear in Acts chapter 8 that they didn't have the Holy Spirit until Peter and John ministered it to them. In Acts chapter 19, again, why would they ask them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? Because they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet, and they needed to receive the Holy Spirit. He said, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. They didn't even have the Holy Spirit. So Paul was wanting to find out, you know, you're believers, have you received the Holy Spirit yet? We receive the Holy Spirit after we're born again. You must understand that that is one of the promises of God. We, it's part of our inheritance. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel, your salvation. You heard the gospel of your salvation. You received Jesus, personal Lord and Savior. You got born again. In whom also, after that you believed, this is after you were born again. What happened? You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What's the Holy Spirit? One of the promises. Who gets a promise? Someone that's out there in the world, does he have a right to a promise? No. Someone that's not born again, does he have a right to the promise? No. Only believers have a right to the promise. The Holy Spirit is a promise of God, which is the earnest or the deposit money, or earnest money as this speaks, this word is, or the first fruit, of our inheritance. That means the Holy Spirit is part of our inheritance. When do we have a right to get an inheritance? When we're born again. Remember what the Bible talks about over in Galatians chapter 4, in verse 7, where he says, If a son, when you're born again, then an heir of God through Christ, which means you can receive your inheritance, which is receiving the Holy Spirit. Receiving the Holy Spirit is to occur in your life. If you never receive the Holy Spirit, you need the Holy Spirit with you. I remember myself, 1974, I got born again. I was changed. My life was radically changed from all the things of this world. And I began to seek after the Lord. It wasn't until a year later, though, that I found out about receiving the Holy Spirit. When I received the Holy Spirit, I would say that my life was radically changed again as far as revelation from the Holy Spirit bringing revelation knowledge and of knowing about the ways of the Lord and the ways of the Spirit and the power of God. You need to receive the Holy Spirit. It will make a great difference in your life. Absolutely essential that we receive the Holy Spirit. As we mentioned, by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, the born-again experience, bringing us into the body of Christ. But then the last part says we've all been made to drink into one Spirit. If I took my hand and stuck it down in the water, the water baptizes me, immerses and engulfs me in the water. It can have an effect upon me, which is what happens when I'm born again, but the water didn't get into me yet. But if I took the same water and drank it, it would get into me, wouldn't it? And it says drink into one spirit. What's this drinking talking about? Drinking is synonymous with taking something into you. In John chapter 7, in verse 37, at the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Drink. That, again, is taking something into you. If I'm drinking something in. What's he talking about? He goes down in verse 39. He says, This spake ye of the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, 
which they that believe on him, this is talking about believers who've been born again, should the same word receive, lambano, take and lay hold of to be received within them. The receiving of the Holy Spirit is the drinking in which brings you into one spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, he's going to do great things in your life. See, the Holy Spirit can't come into your spirit until you have a spirit that's right with God, because he's holy. He's not going to come and dwell in an unclean spirit that's not right. That's why, remember about the wineskins? They had the wine, and they wanted to put it into the wineskin, an old wineskin, but it would break. The new wine is a type of the Holy Spirit put into the wineskin, which is a type of a spirit. The old spirit, one that's not born again. What's the answer? You've got to get a new wineskin, which is a new spirit, the type of. And once we get a new spirit, now the new wine, the Holy Spirit, can come and dwell in that new spirit. This is why the Holy Spirit is received after we are born again. Now, once you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, God wants you to get filled with the Holy Spirit continually, daily. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The word filled is a word which, when we look up the tense voice and mood, if you're here for the first time, we show tense voice and mood that are important to understand what's being said. It is a present tense verb. Literally, you would try, what a present tense means in the Greek is continuous, repeated, ongoing action. So what it means literally is be, being continuously filled with the Spirit. This is supposed to happen on a daily basis. This is not talking about the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in you. This is talking about the filling of the Holy Spirit for the influence of the Holy Spirit for the service of the Lord in your life. How are you going to get continuously filled with the Spirit? It tells us one of the ways. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's why we sing and praise God and minister to Him with all of our heart. Singing songs that are scriptural songs, spiritual songs, things in line with the Word. It is not only ministering to the Lord, it has a dual effect, you're ministering to the Lord, but you're also speaking to yourselves, which is releasing the Holy Spirit filling in your life. Also, God wants you to learn to be a person of prayer. As you pray, it will bring a filling of the Holy Spirit within you. It says in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And what's the purpose of the filling of the Holy Spirit? For the service of the Lord. So you can go forth and serve the Lord and do the things He wants you to do. What they do, it influenced them to speak the Word of God with all boldness. And it talks about that with great power the apostles gave witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all for the service of the Lord as they went forth to get people born again, and ministering deliverance and healing to people to see them be set free. That's what God wants. So being filled with the Holy Spirit is to be a continuous work in your life through praise, worship, prayer, praying in tongues. As you pray in the Spirit, you're going to bring forth what God wants. Now, in Galatians chapter 5, Having said what we've said so far, first of all, we need to be born again, then we receive the Holy Spirit, then we do the things that cause the filling of the Holy Spirit daily. If you haven't gotten to that place in your life, you haven't gotten too far in a lot of things because you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit for the influence of the Holy Spirit for the service of the Lord. You can't do things in the flesh. You can only do things by the Spirit as you do things in line with the Word of God as you're carrying out the service of the Lord. Well, Galatians 5.24 says, Those that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we're going to walk in the Spirit, which is the way that a Christian is to walk, God wants you to crucify the flesh. That means you put to death the deeds of the body, all of its affections, all of its lusts, all of its desires. We are not to walk after the flesh. We are now to walk after the Spirit. He says, If we live in the Spirit, which we do now that we're born again, we have, the, we have the Holy Spirit in us, now we're, remember, we drink into one Spirit. Let us also walk in the Spirit. You are going to walk in the Spirit. In fact, we see the importance of this stated back in verse 16. This I say unto thee, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What happened when you got born again? You got a new spirit. Did you get a new body? No. What's your body? Your body is a body of death. 
Does it want to do the things of God? No, it wants to follow its own lusts, its own desires. We cannot follow the lust of the flesh. It's a body of death. It'll lead you down a path of destruction. This is why it is essential that you crucify the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. In fact, we even see quite a statement that Jesus made in Luke 9, 23. He said, if any man will come after me, or the word will is really the main word here in the Greek. It happens to be the indicative mood, which is the mood of reality or fact. It's the mood that shows the main verb in the sentence. The word come is an infinitive in the Greek, which means literally this is saying, if any man wills to come after me. Or as Young's brings it out, this is Young's literal translation, the most outstanding translation that I know of the New Testament today. If any does will to come after me, he brings things out in line with the word exactly in most all cases and brings out the Greek rendering. What's he say? Let him deny himself. You've got to deny yourself. You can't be walking in your own ways. You cannot follow your own way. We've got to live unto him. And take up his cross daily. Daily. What's the cross where something is put to death? What's to be put to death daily? All the deeds of the body. All the desires of the body. We're not going to walk in those ways. And follow me. How do we follow him? We're going to walk in line with his word. We're going to do the things that he says. That brings us to the next point. If we're going to walk in the spirit, what reveals the way of the spirit? It's the word of God. God's word is spirit, as it says in John chapter 6, 6, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. Your flesh will profit you nothing. It's along for the ride. It's not ever to direct you. You're to be led by your spirit, and you tell your flesh what to do. You don't let it run you. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. God's word is spirit, and it's also life. That's why we need to get the Word of God in us. In fact, in the New Testament, the way you're going to walk in the Spirit is through the Word in you. The Word is going to be written in you in two places. Now that you, if you're in the New Testament, if I've received Jesus, personal Lord and Savior, which is what we're in today, and you're in relationship with God, the Father now, it says, this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their mind, and I'll write them in their hearts. Two places where the word gets put. It gets put in your heart, and it gets put in your mind. The reverse of this is said in Hebrews 10, 16, where he says, This is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. So what's he doing? He's putting and writing His Word in your heart, and He's putting and writing His Word in your mind. In your heart, it's producing faith. In your mind, it's producing hope. You need the Word in your heart because that's where you're going to release spiritual power from. You need the Word in your mind because that's how it's going to affect your thinking, which is going to affect you in the choices that you're making. You need a mind that's going to think as God wants you to think, so you choose the right thing. It's affecting your will because you're going to make choices. God's given us a free will. Now, that brings us to the next point. If you're going to be able to walk in the Spirit, in the realm of the Spirit, after the Word of God, you're going to have to have your mind renewed to the truth. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We're not to be conformed to this world. God does not want you walking in the ways of this world. Friendship of the world makes you an enemy against God. The ways of the world, they're not of the Father, as the Bible says. And all that's in the world is going to pass away, but only the one who does the will of God is going to abide forever. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. But what are we not, we're not to be conformed to this world, but what are we to be? We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The word transform is this Greek word metamorpho. It's where we get the English word metamorphosis. If you remember from science class, and metamorphosis is the process where the caterpillar changes species and becomes a butterfly. That's exactly what happens with you through the Word of God. 
you are changed from a carnal-minded, worldly-minded person to a heavenly-minded, spiritually-minded person, a mind that is, has a spiritual mind. How's it going to happen? <coughs> By the renewing. This word renewing means renovation and complete change. This just isn't adding a few facts to the way you've been living. No. It's a total gutting of all that you have thought and uh, your focus and cho choices and the way you've been thinking and perceiving things in the past. You've got to have an absolute change. An absolute, complete change and a renovation of your mind renewed to the ways of the Spirit. That's what Paul, Paul, he was excellent in the ways of the law. He was zealous in the law and he was above his equals. He was a Pharisee and he excelled in the ways of the law. Walking blameless, as it says. Yet, he had to get rid of it all. He had to get the things of the Spirit in him through the Word of God. He had to get a spiritual mind and get himself walking in the ways of the Spirit. You and I are to get our mind renewed, trans absolutely changed. It's going to transform you. It's going to change you from a spiritual minded, um, a carnal minded person to a spiritual minded person. This is why Colossians chapter 3 says, If you then be risen with Christ, what's that mean? You've been born again. You've been, ra you've been raised from spiritual death unto spiritual life when you got born again. Seek those things which are above. What? What's things above? The things of heaven, see? Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. I want to know the things above. I don't want to waste my time knowing all the things on the earth outside of what I need to do to function in life. I want to know the things above because that's the way we're going to walk. Set your affection or to gain understanding on the things above and not on the things on the earth. You've got to learn the ways of the Spirit, which is revealed through the Word of God, which is spiritual, brings, brings spiritual truth to you. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where it speaks here in verse 9, it says, Eye has not seen nor ear heard, and has entered into the heart of man the things that God's prepared for them that love him. There is a qualifying statement here, isn't it? You've got to love him. And who's the one that loves me? He keeps my commandments. He has my words in him. He does my word. God wants to reveal these things to you. They're prepared for you. We do have to put his word first place and walk in the spirit. But God's revealed unto him, un them unto us by his spirit. He will reveal them by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in you is going to reveal these things unto you. He goes on and says, What man knows the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God know us no man but the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit has come to reveal the things of God unto you. And he goes on and says, We received, as we pointed out, Lombano, taken, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. That's the Holy Spirit. And what's it going to produce? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. All the things that God has for you are all freely given to you. And he wants you to know all these things that are freely given to you. So you can walk in the Spirit, walk in the ways of the Lord, and follow Him. He says, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The Holy Spirit brings revelation of the spiritual things of the Word of God. The natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're, only, they're spiritually discerned, you see. They're foolishness unto Him. Neither can He know them, because they're spiritually discerned. This is why. The God, the Holy Spirit, is going to reveal the things of the Spirit. He will take the Word and He will bring revelation, knowledge unto you. And what's going to happen? You're going to become spiritual. He that's spiritual, you're going to be able to judge all things. And he says in verse 16, he says, Who's known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. How'd they get the mind of Christ? They got it renewed. They got the Word of God in them. They learned the ways of the Spirit. They learn what God's Word said, which is spiritual law. And the mind of Christ gets established in Him. That's what God wants. And in getting the mind of Christ established in you, it involves the Word of God coming into you, and it's going to, first of all, the Holy Spirit's going to bring revelation knowledge to you, revealed knowledge. He's revealing truths to you. Colossians 1.9 speaks about how that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You get spiritual knowledge, first of all. Now, as you take that knowledge 
and you begin to do what the Word says, you apply it, put it in operation in your life, you will get spiritual understanding. Your understanding will be open up. You'll understand how things work as you're working and doing the Word in the realm of the Spirit. And as you continue to apply it in your life, hearing and doing the Word, it will produce wisdom so that you know what to do in every situation. It's going to be a growing process. This is why Paul not only prayed the prayer here, but also in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16, when he was making prayer for them, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. It's going to be revealed unto us. He wants to bring this revelation to us. That the eyes of our understanding, the word understanding is actually the word new, or, uh, uh, it's the word dianoia here, which means mind. It comes from the form of the word nous, which is noia, same root. Dianoia, it means the mind as a faculty of understanding. So this is talking about gaining an understanding in your mind. The eyes of your, the understanding in your mind are to be enlightened or opened up that you might know what's the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. See, he wants to reveal all these things to you so you can know the things that are given to you, so you can know your inheritance in Christ, so you can know the calling of God, so you can have light come into you, so you can know the ways of the Lord, so you will follow after his ways. What's this going to do? It's going to produce the spiritual mind in you, and that's of a necessity. If you have a carnal mind, how are you going to walk in the Spirit with God? You won't. You must have a spiritual mind. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 says, They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Wherever your focus is, is what you're going to be after and what you're going to follow after and what it's going to produce in your life. If you're after the things of the flesh, what I want to do, what I feel like doing, my own desires, independent of considering what God's Word says, I'll mind the things of the flesh. But if I'm after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, how am I going to be after the things of the Spirit? I'm going to be thinking on what the Word says. Then I'll be after following the ways of the things of the Spirit. To be carnally minded or fleshly minded, and that is you're going by your feelings, your own desires, whatever you want to do, your own thinking, independent of considering what the Word says. Just reason according to my, my own way. Carnal minded, human minded, just the way mankind thinks, is death, because it's not a spiritual mind. But to be spiritually minded, which is a word-ruled mind, produces life and peace. He goes on and says the carnal mind's enmity against God. It's not submitted to God's Word. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You never can please God if you're walking in the flesh. God wants to bring you out of walking in the flesh. He wants you to walk in the Spirit but you have to have a spiritual mind. You have to have your mind renewed to the Word of God. Another thing that we see is that once you're born again, Jesus is the cornerstone of the spiritual house of God. You and I are living stones in the house of God. It says in 1 Peter 2, 5, you also as lively stones, or living stones, are built up a spiritual house Actually, this term, build up, is a present tense verb here, as you will see, which means that literally it says, you as lively stones are being built up, showing the process, the ongoing work, because God is a, is a process of you building up, your, being the spiritual house, being built up through the Word. You are being built up a spiritual house. You're a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. And also, you're to offer up spiritual sacrifices unto God. That's why it's important for you to praise and worship God. If you don't praise and worship God, you're not offering up the sacrifices that you are to offer to Him, which is spiritual sacrifices in ministering unto the Lord. We also, as we talk about the sacrifices, it begins with you making your body a living sacrifice. Romans 12.1 we beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. The Old Testament, they offered sacrifice. They killed the animals. They were dead sacrifices. I mean, they were offered living, and then they'd kill them. Well, we don't kill ourselves, of course. We're a living sacrifice, now alive unto God, because we now are born again. It's to be holy, acceptable unto God, that your reasonable service. 
You see, he bought the whole thing, spirit, soul, and body, when you have been redeemed. Your body belongs to him. You're to glorify God in your body. You're to make your body a living sacrifice. It is to be holy, acceptable unto God. It is your reasonable service. And as we mentioned, we are to praise and worship God. The Bible talks about in Hebrews 13, 15. Let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. He wants you to be a praiser and a worshiper of Him. The fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. Your flesh will not want to praise and worship God. You make yourself praise and worship God. As you learn to praise and worship God, you will come in line and you will, and you will want to be ministering unto the Lord, but your flesh will not want to do it. That's why you begin to sing unto the Lord. You begin to praise and worship God. In fact, we sang a song from this next verse. Not only do we praise Him, we praise Him for all the things that He's done, all His mighty acts, but we also worship Him, and you worship Him for who He is. And it says, The hour comes and now is, in John 4, 23, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship Him. The Father is seeking for such to worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. You worship Him in spirit because you're worshiping Him according to the Word of God from the spirit, not from your soul as far as just in a fleshly way or from your body just doing it however you want, but in line with the Word of God. It's going to be in truth. It's always going to be in line with the Word of God. It's going to be a spiritual thing as you're offering up spiritual sacrifice, spiritual worship unto the Lord. Spiritual worship. When we worship, as it talks about over in Philippians 3, it is to be in spirit. It's not to be the way we want to. It's to be in line with His way. It says in Philippians 3, 3, that we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit. Remember the circumcision is of the heart, not physical. It's of the heart. We get a brand new heart when we're born again. We worship God in the spirit. Another thing that's important if we're going to walk in the Spirit is we must understand Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. The word power is a Greek word exousia, which means authority. Young's has corrected it. It means authority. He's delivered us from the authority of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. You've come into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. The kingdom is not just a place of dwelling. The kingdom is a position of rule. Kings rule. You're in the kingdom. Jesus is the king of kings. Who's he the king over? You and I are the kings that he's the king of kings over. You are a king now. We know that. When it talks about, in Revelation 1, verse 6, talking about what he made us. He's now made us kings and priests unto God. You are a king. He expects you to rule and reign under the Lordship of Jesus Christ over all of your enemies. Therefore, if we've been delivered into this position of rule into the kingdom of Jesus Christ, what are we told to do? Well, you've got to learn how to rule. You've got to learn about the things about the kingdom. That's why Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God. You've got to learn how the rule and the reign of God works so that you can rule and reign over all of your enemies, as well as His righteousness, which is the way of the Spirit, spiritual righteousness, walking in line with His Word. And then all these things will be added unto you. In the spiritual kingdom, we now have been given delegated authority, and we release that authority when we speak in the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, like in a power of attorney given to us, whereby we speak in the name and Jesus is doing the works through you and me. At the same time, as you seek the kingdom, you must understand that you have authority over all the power of the enemy. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you, King James says, power to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. It's, again, it's not a good translation. First word, power, exousia, that means authority. Second word, power, look down below, dunamis, which means power. So what this is saying, I give unto you authority, 
to tread on serpents and scorpions, a type of Satan and his evil works, and over all the power of the enemy. The enemy has power. This is why you have to use authority to stop the power of the enemy, and you are to conquer the enemy. Now it goes on and says, nothing shall by any means hurt you. But you must all understand, this is not just a confession that you make. Some people think, well, I'm just going to declare that nothing can by any means will hurt me. Well, that sounds like a good thought, but it's not going to produce the results. Just saying that isn't going to get it done. Why? Because when you look up this word about the verb here, about something hurting someone, it is a subjunctive mood verb. Now, if you're here for the first time, don't be overwhelmed by these things. We explain these things, and they're extremely important to understand, though. The subjunctive mood is a mood that is not speaking of a fact. Otherwise, it's not a fact that nothing shall by any means hurt you just because you've been given authority over all the power of the enemy. Instead, the subjunctive mood expresses things that are contrary to fact that are conditional upon conditions being met. That's what the subjunctive mood means in the Greek. So what it's saying is that you have authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you if the conditions are met. What conditions would that be? You using your authority to conquer the enemy and stop all the power of the enemy from having effect in your life. So you've got to use your authority. It's not just saying I have it. You've got to put it into operation. 2 Corinthians it's chapter 10, that tells us something else. If we're in the kingdom and we're going to rule and reign over enemies, and who's your enemy? Satan's your enemy. 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty or powerful through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You and I have spiritual weapons. Spiritual weapons. We have the Word of God. We have the name of Jesus. You're going to do things in line with the Word of God, and you're going to speak in the name of Jesus, and you're going to smite those enemies, and you're going to destroy those enemies and see them be put underfoot. Again, you must understand who is your enemy. You do have a spiritual enemy, and who is that? It is Satan. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is your problem. Don't look at things in the natural. The devil is your problem. It's hindering you from the things of God coming into manifestation. As a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Satan's trying to devour you. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But you have authority over all the power of the enemy. You can conquer every work of the enemy in your life. But you're going to have to learn your spiritual weapons. And you're going to have to arise and engage in spiritual warfare. 1 Timothy 1.18 says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. You are going to engage in spiritual war, a good warfare against your spiritual enemies to conquer them. That is essential. If you do not learn to engage in spiritual warfare, you will not conquer the enemies in your life. They have to be defeated. They have to be conquered through spiritual means, which means You've got to be committed to doing what God's told you to do because he's called every one of us to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. He says in 2 Timothy 2, 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Will you go over there and tell them to turn that down while they're practicing? We've had it with those people doing this to us continually. He's already doing it again today. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You are a soldier in the army of the Lord. God wants you to endure hardness as a good soldier. It means you're going to have attacks come against you, but God wants you to get tough. He wants you to get strong. He wants you to fight against all these enemies. A good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth, when we're warring, entangles himself with the affairs of this life. It means you can't be all caught up with all the things of this life and think that you're going to engage in warfare. No. Spiritual warfare, we need to engage in it that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Has God chosen you and I to be a soldier? Yes. What's he want us to do? Engage in warfare. Warfare. You're going to conquer the enemy and destroy their works. How are you going to do this? You do have to get spiritual power within you. 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. God wants you to walk in the Spirit. And how are you going to do it? You're going to do it through spiritual warfare with spiritual power. Power. When he talks about being strong, this is a form of the word dunamo, dunamis, dunamo, and dunamo, which literally would be to be empowered within, which is what produces spiritual strength within you. You're to be empowered within. God wants, he commands us, by the way. This is a commanding statement. God would not command us, it's imperative mood verb, to be empowered within if we couldn't be. And also, notice this is a present tense, which means ongoing action. You are to continually be empowered within in the Lord. God wants it. You mean, tell me I'm supposed to be full of power, continually operating in my life? That's right. And in the power of His might. This is a different word for power. This is a power that releases the power of God with mighty force. Mighty force. As you put the power of God in operation. How's the power of God going to get into you? Through the Word in you. The Word in you is going to produce the power of God resident within you. Then you're going to minister the power of God out of you as you pray the Word of God with mighty force. Now, why do we need to do this? Or how are we going to do this? You put on the whole armor of God. Put on is an interesting word in the Greek. It's a word, enduo, which means to sink into clothing. Like you're putting on clothes. And it's interesting, this is something that you are responsible to do. This is also an imperative mood. God has commanded us to do this. And also, it's a middle voice, which means, the Greek in the middle voice means a person does it for himself. The active voice means the person does it. Passive voice, somebody else does it to him. Middle voice, he does it for his own benefit. So what's that telling you? You and I are to clothe ourselves with the whole armor of God that you and I may be able to stand against all of the wiles, the tr trick strategies of the devil. So we're going to clothe ourselves through the Word of God in you. And why do we need to do that? Because with the power of God resident in us, what are we going to do? We're going to fight a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6.12 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood. People are not our problem, but principalities, powers, Rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in the high places. Satan's very highly organized. He's got a network of spirits that are operating. That's why intercession is an ongoing work to destroy and dismantle the demonic network of spirits that are operating, the principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, and spiritual wickedness. That's why God needs intercessors who will engage in warfare intercession to destroy these operation of these spirits in the heavenlies. Also, he's given you a spiritual sword. Spiritual sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The word for word is the word rhema, which means that which is spoken. You speak forth with your mouth, which is a sword being put into operation. Your mouth is like a sword. It's, he made your mouth like a sharp sword. You're going to smite enemies. You're going to use your mouth to war with as you speak to conquer the enemies because the power of God is going to be released out of you through your mouth. You also, you've got a spiritual shield. You can take the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You have a spiritual shield that will deal with every attack of the enemy. By the way, this isn't a shield like you see in the movies, you know, a little small, little shield. If you look up the word in the Greek, it's a huge, oblong, huge shield that was all, covered the entire person. When you speak the word of God, your shield of faith will be put up, and it will quench all the tar attacks of the enemy. And the devil's attacking you, trying to get you into sin, trying to get you to give place to the enemy in your life to bring destruction. This brings us to the place when you are going to engage in spiritual warfare to conquer your enemy. You are going to enter into the kingdom, the rule and the reign of God, using force and violence. Spiritual force and violence. This may not be, well, I'm not, a for, I'm not a forceful person. I'm a nice, passive, nice person. You should be that way to everybody in the world. But when it comes to spiritual things, it's a different ball game. We are not going to be passive in dealing with spiritual enemies, 
I reiterate against this. No. It says, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. That's what John the Baptist began to bring forth, talking about Jesus coming. Jesus ministered the things of the kingdom. They did in the book of Acts. And every man presses into it. That's you and me. That means this is what it takes something he's talking about to enter into the kingdom. And what's this word press mean? The word presseth is a Greek word, biadzo, which means to use force, to apply force, to inflict violence on. Who are we applying force to or on and inflicting violence against? The evil spirits. Satan and all of his evil spirits that you and I are going to conquer in our life. They are the root behind the problems. We have got to win the battle in the spirit against all these enemies. You are to get strong in spirit. You gotta understand, John the Baptist, he had to get strong in spirit for the prophet's ministry. Speaking to John the Baptist, he grew and waxed or became strong in spirit. Well, Jesus had to do the same thing. Remember, Jesus didn't operate as God. He operated as a man. He walked the walk that Adam had failed. And in Luke 2, 4, 40, it says the same thing. The child grew. This is speaking about Jesus. And waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. He had to grow and become strong also. Jesus became strong and mighty. That's exactly what you and I are to do as well. And as you have the power of God in you, what are you going to do? You're going to use the weapons that have been given to you to conquer enemies in your life. What are we told to do? Well, in Mark chapter 16 and verse 17, the Bible says, These signs shall follow them that believe. These are spiritual signs that are going to follow you. What's the first one on the list? You're going to cast out devils. You're going to cast out the evil spirits. Why do we need to cast out evil spirits? Because evil spirits have come into us from the open door of sin. They've come in from inheritance because of the sins and iniquities of our forefathers from three, four generations back. They've come in from our own sins and they've come in from being victimized. That's why Jesus was casting out demons every place. And it hadn't changed a bit today because those, these signs follow them to believe. When you cast out the spirits, what are you doing? You're getting rid of the root cause of the problem in order to see people be liberated from captivity in their life. God has given you a spiritual authority. He wants you to use that to conquer the enemies in your life. We see something else. You're going to function by faith. How am I going to walk by faith if I'm going to walk in the spirit by faith? You're going to do it with a spirit of faith that you've been given. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, we having the same spirit of faith you have a spirit of faith. You're to put it in operation. How do I put it in operation? I believe, therefore have I spoken. Remember how you release things? It's with your mouth. We believe and therefore we speak. And notice, every one of us has the same spirit of faith. It's the faith of Jesus Christ. You got it when you're born again. It is a spirit of faith, not a feeling. Well, I don't feel faith. It has nothing to do with feelings. It all has to do with you operating in the spirit according to the Word of God, putting your spirit of faith in operation, believing the Word and speaking and or doing the Word of God to see the promises of God come to pass. Another thing you must understand, all the promises of God have been given to you because if you're going to walk in the Spirit, what am I going to do? Not only am I going to conquer the enemy, but I'm going to possess promises. Ephesians 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. You've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings. They already belong to you. That means you are to receive all these blessings that have already been given to you. If they've already been given to you, that means they belong, belong to you in Christ, in the covenant relationship. And notice they're spiritual blessings before they come into manifestation in the natural. God wants us to learn, of course, how are we going to bring these spiritual blessings into operation? It's through prayer. This is why you've also got to learn how to pray. When you pray, you're going to pray in the Spirit in order to see results. Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. 
all prayer to be effective is to be in the Spirit. How is it going to be in the Spirit? When it's in line with the Word of God or when it's directed by the Holy Spirit? Spiritual words being released that you're praying that are going to release spiritual power or take hold of spiritual blessings that belong to you. You're going to learn to pray accurately in the Spirit. There's two ways that you pray in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. One way that you pray in the Spirit is praying with the Spirit. I'm also going to pray with the understanding also, or with my mind, this means, according to the Word. So there's another way of praying in the Spirit, with my mind, praying the Word of God. So I'm going to pray with my spirit, and I'm going to pray with my mind. Both of those are going to be in the Spirit if we're praying in line with God's Word. Now, what does it mean about praying with the Spirit? If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. Praying in tongues is praying with your spirit. Why should we want to have this prayer language of praying in tongues? Because it enables you to pray with your spirit by means of the Holy Spirit who gives you the prayer language. You have it already on the inside of you once you have the Holy Spirit there. So you can speak forth with your spirit what the Holy Spirit would pray through you. Why is it in an unknown tongue? Because you're releasing God at His level of understanding, not coming down to your level of understanding. I'm speaking in the Spirit things that He knows that I don't know. With my mind, I'm only going to speak with what I know. So if I'm just praying with my mind only, in line with the Word, that's good. But I'm also limited to my level of knowledge. Is there a way that I can pray that would be beyond my knowledge, that would be praying what God the Holy Spirit knows needs to be prayed for, that would be praying something that's going to be a perfect prayer according to the will of God, always directed by God the Holy Spirit? Boy, that'd be fantastic if I could do that. It's exactly what praying in tongues is. Praying in tongues is a spiritual prayer language where you pray and release what the Holy Spirit would pray through you, praying with your spirit. This is why the devil has fought this in the body of Christ. The two big things he's fought is casting out demons and praying in tongues. He doesn't want to get the demons out of people because that's the real root of the problem in order to get set free. And he doesn't want people to pray in tongues because that's the way to pray a perfect prayer, releasing what the Holy Spirit would pray through you. So you need your prayer language. Don't be afraid of it if you've never received your prayer language. If you receive the Holy Spirit, you have the prayer language. You can pray in tongues at will. It's there. It's a matter of just getting this prayer language started and getting this coming forth. And then as you begin to pray in tongues, you're going to release what the Holy Spirit will pray through you. It also has a dual effect, not only speaking unto God, as it says here in verse 2, he that speaks in an unknown tongues speaks not unto men. We're not speaking to men. We're speaking unto God. Howbeit uh, no man understands him, howbeit in, the uh, no, howbeit in the Spirit. What are you doing? You're speaking in the Spirit. Mysteries or divine secrets, things that you don't know. Why would I want us pray something and speak something that I don't know? Because you don't know everything. But God knows everything. So why don't I speak what He knows to release Him at His level, way up here? instead of always being down at my level. God wants you to have your prayer language. Also, it has a dual effect. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. It brings a spiritual edifying and building up and strengthening spiritually within you. It also brings a filling of the Spirit. It's one of the ways you see the filling of the Holy Spirit for the influence of the Lord. God wants us to do all these things. Now, as we learn all these things and we begin to walk in the Spirit and do these things, he wants to make sure that you don't fall back into the ways of the flesh. Many Christians have started out in the Spirit, but they ended up going back in the ways of the flesh instead of continuing in the things of the Word of God, which is a mistake. He said to the Galatians, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? 
is we're going to go on into perfection, as the Bible talks about in the Lord. We've been talking about spiritual growth and how we're going to go on to perfection, walk blameless and holy before the Lord, undefiled, without rebuke, without spot, because that's the, Je the church that Jesus is going to present to himself when he comes back. Are you made perfect by the flesh? No, they went back into the ways of the flesh. Can we have any of the works of the flesh in our life? No, absolutely not. And works of the flesh are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, which is strife, emulations, wrath, strife. This is a different thing. This is one desire to put yourself forward, uh, getting your agenda ahead of everybody else. I, I want to be the best type of a thing. Seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and of such like, which I tell you before, as I've told you in the time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He didn't want these things in us. Now, all these things, these sexual things, they've got to be eliminated from your life. All this uncleanness has got to be eliminated from our life. You can't have these kind of things. What's he want? The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. Against such, there's no law. See, we've got to learn that the things of the Spirit are what are going to bring forth blessings and life in us. At the same time, we've got to understand, God's not mocked. Galatians 6, 7, you think you're going to get away with walking in the flesh? No. God's not mocked. Be not deceived. He's not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, he's going to reap. You sow some things in the flesh, you're going to be reaping some bad news, bad things. He that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's destruction. But he that sows to the Spirit, in line with the Word, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Yeah, that's important. We want to be sure we're reaping the right thing. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And we'll see those blessings, the things that God wants to bring forth in our life. He wants us also to understand that we can conquer all temptations in our life. In Matthew 26, 41. In every situation where the devil would try to tempt you to sin in any aspect or yield to the flesh or walk contrary to his ways, look what it says. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Notice you've got to enter into it. The temptation is coming at you, but it doesn't take root and produce sin until you enter into it or you allow, you allow it to take root in you. The spirit indeed is willing. The word willing actually means ready and willing. Your spirit is always ready and willing to do the right thing. Always. And that's what you're to live by, your spirit. While the flesh, it's weak, it will yield to it left and right. That's why you've got to crucify the flesh daily. You cannot be giving place to any of these things. Not only do we need to crucify the flesh, but God also wants us to get cleansed of all of these things. Spiritual cleansing has to come forth in your life. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Having therefore these promises, we get all these promises, all these spiritual blessings that are given to us. What's he want us to do? Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all, not some, all. What? Filthiness. What's the filthiness of? The flesh and spirit. Filthiness of the flesh, we get rid of all the fleshly works. What's the filthiness of the Spirit? I thought I got a brand new Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in me. Is there anything filthy in that? No. What's the filthiness of the Spirit? It's all the evil spirits that are in us that have to be cast out. That is why uh, the word for uh, normal uh, saying for unclean spirits, uh, evil spirits in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels was unclean spirits, used some 20 times in the Gospels. So all these filthy, unclean, defiling spirits need to be cast out. They're affecting you adversely in your life in order to perfect holiness in the fear of God. We also need to be sure, if we're going to walk in the Spirit, that we have our focus on the things that are not seen. If you're being moved by what you see, by what you feel, by the natural, you're going to be walking in the flesh all the time. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, We look not at the things which are seen, but we're looking at the things that are not seen. What does that tell you? There's an unseen realm that we don't see in the natural, but it's there. It's as real as you and I are. That's the realm of the Spirit. 
it controls what goes on in the natural. Everything from the Spirit was brought in to produce the things in the natural. God said, let there be light, spiritual words from the Spirit, and there was light. He spoke things into being. Things are spiritual first. So we're not going to look at the things that are seen. We're going to look at the things that are not seen because the things that are seen are temporal, subject to change. But all the things that are not seen are eternal. You're going to tap into the way things are in the realm of the Spirit. And you're going to see the promises of God as you take hold of them with your faith and prayer faith. And also the enemies, the evil spirits that are arrayed against you, you're going to take dominion over them, whether you're going to cast them out or you're going to bind them or you're going to cast them down, you're going to speak to mountains, you're going to resist them, you're going to use your authority to conquer the enemy, all of his temptations, all of his attacks that come against you. God wants us to come to the place where we are going to keep our eyes on the things of the Lord. Also, we must understand you're going to serve the Lord. All of your service it must be in spirit, according to the Word of God. We're not serving in the natural. We're serving in the spirit, doing what God says. Romans 7, 6 says, Now we're delivered from the law. We're not under the Old Testament law anymore. We're under the New Testament. That being dead there and where we were held, we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. You're now going to serve after the newness of spirit, after the ways of the New Testament, and carry out the ministry of the Spirit. Also, our fellowship now. We are to have fellowship. What kind of fellowship are we supposed to have? It's to be fellowship of the Spirit, spiritual fellowship. Unfortunately, many Christians have carnal fellowship all the time. Instead of having spiritual fellowship, instead of having spiritual fellowship, not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit serving the Lord. He wants you fervent. He wants you zealous for the things of God. If you're zealous for the things of God, if your focus is upon Him, if you're focusing on your own self or the things of the flesh or the things of this world, how zealous are you going to be for the things of God? You're not. You know, you'll try to fit it in if you've got any time. If you're fervent in spirit for the servants of the Lord, you've got your priorities in line. You've got your priorities. You're going to get in the Word. You're going to do all the things God says. You're going to make time to serve the Lord. You're going to have these things in line of all the things that God wants you to do. That's what He's looking for, those who are going to walk in the Spirit. He wants you also rejoicing, rejoicing in the Spirit. Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit. Why do I rejoice? Because I'm going to keep my eyes on the Lord. Luke 10, 21, it says, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit. He rejoiced. That's what God wants you to do. He wants you to rejoice in spirit. That means, you know, the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Well, how can I rejoice when I've got these terrible circumstances going on? That's because you got the wrong focus. If you were looking at the realm of the Spirit and you see God's the answer for everything and He's given you dominion over the enemy and you can conquer Him and He has all these promises that have been given to you and all these spiritual blessings and you can come boldly to the throne of grace and take hold of His mercy and find grace or favor to help in your time of need, hey, I'm going to rejoice in the Spirit because I know every God's the answer to everything and if I just do what He says, I'll come out victorious. If you got your eyes on the natural, you won't be rejoicing much at all. Why do people get depressed, down, discouraged, poor old me, all these things? Because they don't have their eyes on the things of the Spirit. They got their eyes on the natural. God wants us to come out of all these things. He also wants you to learn to speak right words. Words, remember, are what puts your faith in operation. And He wants you to speak right words, because the Word of God that you speak, spiritual words, are going to bring the blessings of God for you. you got to understand, as it says in Psalms 45, 1, that your tongue is the pen of a writer, writer, ready writer. It's writing things in the Spirit. And what are you going to do? You want to be sure you're speaking right words because it's writing it in the realm of the Spirit. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace, which would be the word of His grace, is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. That's not for a short time. If you will pour right words into your mouth and speak right words, because words are releasers. They release power. They release the promises. They release the blessings. They release your inheritance. They release your faith. They release the, the authority that God's given unto you. 
God will bless you forever if you learn to speak right words. Walking in the Spirit is essential. It all starts with, of course, first getting born again. Now you've got a new spirit and a new heart. Then you receive the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in you. Then you keep yourself filled up with the Spirit through praise, worship, prayer, so that you're going to be led and influenced by the Holy Spirit. Then you're going to walk in the Spirit because you put the Word of God first place and you're going to do what the Word says. The Word's coming into your heart producing faith. It's coming in your mind producing hope. And you're going to get your mind renewed so your mind is thinking correctly in line with the Word. And you're going to gain knowledge. You're going to put it in operation. You'll gain spiritual understanding. Keep on applying it. You're going to have wisdom, knowing what to do. And you realize you are a spiritual house that's being built up to be, become the house of God, to go on, grow up into the things of God and become strong. You also realize you have sacrifices to offer unto God like they did in the Old Testament. But it's not physical sacrifice, it's spiritual sacrifice, it's praise and worship and doing good and ministering to the things of God. We also, as we praise and worship Him in spirit, we're going to bring the filling in the presence of God. We also realize that we've come into the kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. So we need to seek the kingdom. We've got to learn our weapons of warfare. We've got to know our spiritual weapons. And we've got to start using these spiritual weapons against the enemy, using the authority delegated to us to conquer all evil spirits' activity in our life. We're going to get spiritually strong by putting on the whole armor of God through the Word of God, the power of God resident within us. And we're going to do the works of God. We're going to cast out the demons. We're going to pray in tongues. We're going to intercede. We're going to have these spiritual signs, power flowing out of us because we're going to operate in the Spirit. We're also going to put our spirit and fa faith, spirit of faith in operation at all times by believing the Word and speaking it. All these spiritual blessings are ours. We're going to take hold of them as we pray the Word of God and speak things into being. We're going to pray with our spirit, in the spirit, in tongues, and in with our mind in line with the Word of God. We want to be sure also that we're going through the cleansing process. We've got to get rid of all this filthy stuff out of us that's warring against us. All the demons got to be cast out. All the fleshly works got to be eliminated. And if you don't start doing that, you're going to be fighting against these problems for the rest of your life, and they're not going to go away. If you've been fighting against some things, and yeah, I've been fighting a long time, and I've been to every program there is out there and still got the same old problems because we haven't done what God said. If we don't get involved in deliverance, we're not going to get victory. Jesus said we're to cast out the demons. We also have to learn that we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to do it with fervency. We're going to rejoice in Him. We're going to have fellowship. We're going to learn to speak right words. We're going to walk in the Spirit. God wants you to function in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, do everything in line with His ways of the Spirit. As you do that, you're going to grow up in all things. You're going to become strong. You're going to become full of power. You're going to get full of faith. You're going to get full of the Holy Spirit. You're going to be full of wisdom through applying the Word in your life. That's what those guys were in the book of Acts, because they did these things. That's what God's going to raise up, a mighty army of the Lord in these last days, because you and I are going to do the same thing. And you're going to see the works of God be done in you and through you, because we are going to walk in the Spirit. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your Word, which is the truth that reveals that I now am to walk in the Spirit in line with the Word of God. I thank you. If I've received Jesus, I'm born again. If I've received the Holy Spirit, I have the Holy Spirit within me. I can pray in tongues at will. I'm going to use my prayer language. I'm going to get filled with the Spirit through praise and worship and ministering unto you and prayer. I'm putting the Word first place. It's going to renew my mind. I'm going to walk in the Word, being a hearer and a doer of the Word. I'm going to get knowledge. I'm going to do it, gain spiritual understanding, continue to apply it, It'll produce wisdom. I'm a spiritual house, and I'm being built up, and I'm offering spiritual sacrifices of praise and worship, and I have entered into a spiritual kingdom, and I'm to rule and reign over the devil and all evil spirits. I have spiritual authority delegated to me. I have spiritual weapons that I can use to conquer the enemy. I will engage 
in spiritual warfare, having become spiritually strong, empowered within, putting the power of God in operation to conquer the enemies. I do it with my spirit of faith. I do everything with my spirit of faith as I believe and act on the word and speak it forth. And I will take hold of the promises and I will pray with my spirit and tongues, with my mind in line with the word. I will go through the cleansing process. I will cast out all the demons. I will crucify the flesh. I will get rid of all the filthy spirits. I'll get rid of all the fleshly filthiness in every area of my life. I will serve you. I will be fervent. I will walk in fellowship, spiritual fellowship. I'm not engaging in carnal fellowship of this world. I'm going to only have spiritual fellowship. I'm going to keep a rejoicing spirit and I'm going to speak right words. I will walk in the spirit and walk with you all the days of my life. In Jesus name. Amen. Praise God. You start doing all these things, you're going to see God working in your life tremendously. You're going to see enemies getting eliminated from your life. You're going to see promises coming to pass. You're going to grow up in the things of God. You're going to become full of power, full of faith, full of might, full of the Holy Ghost, full of all wisdom, all these things that God wants. And that's where we're all headed. Operate in the Spirit and watch God work for you. Father, we thank you for all the things that you brought forth. We will hearken to your word and be hearers and doers of this word. Thank you for much fruit as we do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now as we conclude, does anyone here that's never received Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior? It's the most important decision that you ever make in your life. You will not go to heaven if you're not born again. That is for sure. I invite you to come forward. I'd like to pray for you if you've never been born again. Let me help you pr pray for you to lead you to receive Jesus this morning. If you've been born again and you have not received the Holy Spirit since you've been born again, we clearly saw that receiving the Holy Spirit is subsequent to salvation. You need to receive the Holy Spirit. I don't care what kind of teaching you've had out there. We saw it from the Word of God. The Word is the truth. Don't follow the doctrines of men. Follow the, tr the, tr the truth of the Word of God. If you've never received the Holy Spirit since you've been born again, I want to pray for you. If you come on up, I want to pray for you to lead you to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come into you immediately. If you never got your prayer language, I want to invite you to come forward. Once you receive the Holy Spirit, we'll help you to get your prayer language flowing forth. God, God wants everybody to pray in tongues. Also, if you have not been engaging in deliverance, God wants you to get these demons cast out. You want to start working on this. It's a process. I would like to make an appointment with you. I'll sit down and talk to you in a confidential appointment. Explain deliverance to you. Talk about the problem areas in your life. Start ministering to you one-on-one -on -one and helping you and encouraging you and continue to minister to you as well as provide cast-out se sessions that we have that you can use to continue to drive out all these spirits to see you get victory in every area of your life. We encourage you to get in the Word of God. Put the Word of God first place and do what He says. If you need prayer in any area, We'll be glad to pray for you or pray for whatever needs that you might have. Praise God. Father, thank you for all you've brought forth. Thank you that each one who might have needs would come forward to be born again or receive the Holy Spirit or get their prayer language or get involved in deliverance or a prayer area. Thank you for meeting those needs in their life. Father, we thank you that we will be hearers and doers of this word as we go forth. We will walk in the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. If you need prayer, come forward. Have a wonderful day afternoon. Tonight, 6.30, we'll be talking another important message. God bless. You're dismissed.